Okay, I'm going to give a brief introduction to our organization. We are Free Speech Ireland. We were an organization started by students back in 2018 in Cork. We have since grown to be beyond a student organization with people who are graduates from various colleges all over the country. Um, thank you for coming to the event today. And uh, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to what the organization is without holding up anyone, because we only have the room for two hours. Our first speaker will be Professor Jared Casey, uh, formerly of the philosophy department of UCD. And uh, he has a great grounding when it comes to the actual philosophy of libertarianism and what it is to have free speech. Some people might call him a bit of a radical. And I remember saying to Casey over the phone that this is not a debate, to which he responded, uh, that's OK, but I will win anyway. So uh, without further ado, our first speaker, please give a round of applause for Professor Jerry Casey. <laughs> So thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to the organi organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's always a mistake to ask me to come to speak, because you never can guarantee I will ever shut up. But uh, I only have 10 minutes, so this will be very, very brief. This is what we're here to talk about. The Criminal Justice Incitement to Violence or Hatred and Offenses Bill 2022. And the first thing you might ask is, why do we need such an act? given that, for example, we already have a prohibition of incitement to hatred act in 1989. Uh, the clue is in the name, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and the non-fatal offenses against the person act 1997, which prohibits harassment. So we already have these laws. What do we need this one for? So something worth remembering, by the way, which hasn't, I think, so far been pointed out in anything I've seen on this, on this uh, comments on this bill so far, is that this bill is intended to give effect to, to a European Council framework, uh, 2008. So this is coming to us as an instruction from Europe. Okay, we've gone, by the way, oh, well above and beyond what we are being required to do okay, by, the, by the European framework, but that's where it's coming from. Uh, which which the, the, the European framework was um, designed to combat certain forms and expressions of racism and xenophobia by means of the criminal law. Again, I'm going to come back to that very briefly. Now, the bill really falls into two parts, uh, one dealing with the crime of hate speech and the other with hate crime. These are two distinct types of thing. It's very easy to get confused. They're not the same, and they are confused <laughs> all the time. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to give a brief account of what's involved in this, and then just uh, raise a few points and, 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 as it were, indicate by looking at what's happened in other jurisdictions, what we might see, what we might expect to see coming down the tracks. And it won't make you happy. It doesn't make me happy. All right, so I'll begin with hate crime. A hate crime is an action that would be criminal even without the hate, but one in which the motivation for the commission of the crime is the hatred of a specific category of victim. It's a crime committed against Tom, Dick, or Harriet not in their capacities as individual human beings, but as members or representatives of certain groups conceived to be specially at risk. You can see immediately, of course, that this falls firmly into the lap of identity politics, right smack into it. The bill lists 10 protected characteristics. The list keeps growing, by the way, and soon it'll be so big we'll all be in it, and then what's the point? But anyway, it's not here or there. Uh, these include race, color, nationality, religion, national or ethnic origin, descent, gender, sex characteristics, sexual orientation, and disability. A number of peculiar things about this list. First of all, race is a disputed category. My sociology friends in UCD would be very unhappy because they argue there isn't any such thing. Right? That's not here nor there. The second one is color. The bill doesn't tell you anything other than color. What? What color? The color of my hair? the color of my eyes, my shoes. You know what they mean, of course, but they're, they're, so, they're so scared to say it. They mean skin color, right? Because clearly, otherwise, it has no significance whatsoever. But it doesn't say that. Um, and, then, and then, by the way, so here's the question. Why these characteristics and not others? Why race, for example, but not age? Why not attempt to stamp out hatred against people who speak with a Cork accent? Okay. Or people who have red hair, the last remaining acceptable form of discrimination, by the way. Or people who are politically conservative. Why aren't they included? 
What does color mean? Okay. And by the way, why sex characteristics rather than just sex? And what, pray tell, is gender? If you read this bill, you will look in vain to find out what gender is because it doesn't tell you, or rather it tells you the following. Gender means, and I read, it, it means the gender of a person or the gender which a person expresses as the person's preferred gender or with which the person identifies and includes transgender and the gender other than those of male and female. Now, it's an elementary thing in logic that when you're defining a term, you cannot use that term in the definition, right? Otherwise, it's circular. <laughs> and you notice here that it's completely circular. You're not told at any stage what gender is, still less what transgender is, or what an identified gender is, nor, indeed, if any of these elaborations have anything to do with one another, if they're the same thing or different things, or if they're consistent with each other. This is simply incoherent. If this, is, if this section is meant to give a definition of gender, it manifestly fails for no coherent attempt to define a term X, as I say, can include X in the proposed definition. But if it's not meant to define gender, that leaves us with another problem, since gender appears to be defined nowhere in the bill. And why a concern, by the way, only with hate? as a motivation for crime. Crimes can be motivated by all sorts of psychological attitudes. Jealousy, envy, cupidity. <coughs> I suspect that if somebody burgles your house, they probably don't dislike you. They probably don't even know you. They certainly don't hate you. They just want your property, right? So why not jealousy crime? People get murdered because of jealousy or envy. Why hate? What's so special about hate as a motivation for crime? Now, hate crimes are, are, de are demanded by a variety of victim groups, largely for symbolic reasons, a recognition of their special victim status, and, and this is the important thing, for the preemptive repression of criticism. It's meant to shut you up before you even get to open your mouth. And just as a policy of affirmative action and gender quotas paradoxically institutionalize and reinforce the very divisions in society that they are allegedly intended to eliminate, so too hate crime laws implant considerations of race and sexual orientation and religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, firmly into the heart of public policy making and lawmaking. And that being so, it's not obvious that delineating sections of the population as permanent victims who have a claim to special consideration and treatment will promote the idea that justice is and ought to be blind. Hate crime laws attempt to eliminate hatred in society by the use of the criminal law. This is insane. I'm not defending hate. Hate is a very suspect attitude that we have towards anything except injustice. But it's not a fit Thing for the criminal law to seek to eliminate any more than it would be to eliminate jealousy or envy or cupidity. But if our experience has taught us anything, it is that you cannot legislate for morality. And that's what we're talking about here. OK, that's enough about hate crime. The second part of the bill is largely concerned with this. And what it does, in effect, is to say we have all of these crimes. And the tariff for conviction, if you commit this crime and your motive is determined to be hate, will be increased. That's it. OK, are we clear on all that? Is that we clear on that? Fine. Now I turn to the one that really concerns me, which is hate speech. And hate speech is a crime in which the speech itself is the offensive element. It's not a crime with hatred attached. It's speech that expresses hate in some way. You might think, don't we have a right not to be gratuitously offended? And the answer is, no, we don't. There is no such right. Who, after all, is to determine objectively what is and what isn't offensive? I'm offended every day, OK? If I read the Irish Times, I would be offended for a week. <laughs> In a cohesive society, social conventions, manners, and etiquette will generally do a reasonably good job in setting limits to the extent of offensive speech. In a society in the process of disintegration, which is what our society is, Law is dragged into the fray, and the giving and taking of offense becomes a matter for determination by legislators who have no obvious qualifications for such determination. 
I, I don't mean to offend any legislators here this evening. It might be argued that people shouldn't make offensive comments, and so it doesn't much matter if we have laws outlawing such comments. The problem here is that the shouldn't in people shouldn't make offensive comments is moral, but the outlawing is legal. And one of the things I tried to teach my students was to keep these two categories rigidly separated, if at all possible. I shouldn't swear or commit adultery or drink to excess either, but do we really want to make swearing or adultery or excessive drinking or whatever our current normative environment considers morally reprehensible to be punishable by law? What if free speech that isn't merely offensive but is downright hateful? Shouldn't that be prohibited? Well, my answer is no, a resounding N-O, no. Legal prohibition is not in order here either. If you can't express your biases or your hatreds or what others perceive to be your biases or hatreds, you've been preemptively gagged. You are at the mercy of those who get to determine what is and what isn't hate speech, where hate speech will turn out to be whatever those who are given to censorship and have the power to censor find hateful. But speech which is merely offensive to certain individual groups should not be censored by legal means, and the very existence of hate speech laws implicitly denies that there are ways, non-legal but very effective ways, of regulating speech, and insinuating that without legal prohibition there would be no constraints on what can and cannot be said. But societies have always regulated speech informally through social sanctions. So let me give you an example I used to give to my students. You're walking down Grafton Street and somebody comes to you weighing about 40 stone. Okay? This is what you will not say. You will not go up to that person and say, my God, you're fat. And the reason you won't do that is because you've been brought up properly. Right? We don't do those kind of things. And people who do have not been properly socialized and the penalty is they are basically excommunicated from polite society. That's how we deal with it. If free speech then, if it is to be genuinely free, cannot just be for the virtuous and the well-intentioned and the polite. Hate speech laws, however well-intentioned they may be, are patronizing and infantilizing. They are un essentially unfit for purpose in any society that purports to be liberal and to value free speech. I've got time for just a few examples, and needless to say, since, thank God, this, act is not, this bill is not yet an act and so not in effect here yet, these will come from abroad. Um, a glance across the Irish Sea reveals a titanic struggle by women there to protect female-only spaces and services from invasion by so-called trans women, that is biological men who think they're women, and their difficulty in trying to defend those spaces and services in the face of the Damocles sword of accusations of transphobia. I had the privilege of attending Women's Space Ireland Convention a couple of weeks ago, and there were 180 women there, and I would hate to be on the wrong side of any one of them, still less the 180. Mercifully, I was on the right side. It's one time in my life I've actually been popular with women, but there we are. Too late. Um, <laughs> in Norway, Christina Ellingson, who was at that meeting, said, I do not believe that men who claim to be women uh, girls, lesbians, or mothers are what they claim to be. And because she said this, she is under investigation by the Norwegian police and has been under investigation for nine months for a, uh, what is it, uh, for suspected hate speech on the grounds of gender identity. And what have we got in our bill? Gender, gender identity, gender expression. Okay, it's coming this way, guys. A few weeks ago, in the UK, a Ministry of Justice staff received an email marked official and sensitive containing a glossary entitled Recognizing Transphobic Coded Language, which contained 35 phrases which included, wait, this is transphobic, protecting women's spaces and, I know this is going to shock you, adult human female. That's transphobic. There are a lot of adult human females here this evening. Hello. <laughs> okay. Pastor Ake Green of Borkholm Pentecostal Church in Sweden was sentenced to a month in prison for preaching against homosexuality. 
it doesn't matter what your attitude is, whether it's welcoming, supporting, against, it doesn't really make any difference. But the point is he got a month in prison. He did not advocate aggression towards homosexuals, but simply restated the biblical understanding of homosexual activity as intrinsically evil. This was considered sufficient to warrant a guilty verdict and time in jail during which the errant pastor could reflect on his evil ways. A few weeks ago in the UK, the Crown Prosecution Service took it upon itself to advise that, quote, and this is a quotation, there are references in the Bible which are simply no longer appropriate in modern society and which would be deemed offensive if stated in public. So leave your Bible at home. Are fears of a police state approach to online speech exaggerated? Well, no. There's a famous case of Harry Miller, the uh, ex-policeman, who retweeted a limerick which expressed skepticism about whether transgender women were biological women. The limerick, by the way, which won't win any poetry prizes, included the inspired and immortal lines, your breasts are made of silicone, your vagina goes nowhere. Okay? <laughs> you have to admit, it's not great poetry. Okay? Uh, he, was, he was contacted by a police constable, Mansur Gul, who told him that, if, that his retweet would be recorded as a hate incident. Um, um, the police constable said, although none of the tweets were criminal, I said to Mr. Miller that the limerick is the kind of thing that upsets the transgender community. I warned him that if it escalates, we will have to take further action. Apparently, he was following up a complaint. At one point, the police constable referred to the complainant as a victim, and when Mr. Miller wondered how there could be a victim if there had been no crime, PC Gull informed him, we need to check your thinking. We need to check your thinking. You'd be glad to hear, by the way, that Miller won a case in the UK Court of Appeals against the police policy of recording gender critical views as, quote, listen to this, a non-crime hate incident. A what? A non-crime hate a non-crime hate incident. The Court of Appeal said that such a policy had a chilling effect on free speech, as indeed it does. What normal person is going to open his mouth on anything to do with any of these topics when the police are likely to arrive at your door? So, in the end, of course, what happens in the UK and the USA and in Norway and elsewhere are eventually washes up on our shore. Okay, so what in the end is this bill about? And as I said, uh, I can do no more than reproduce P.C. Gull's Lamont phrase, we need to correct your thinking. It's all about thought crime. So what should we do with this bill? What does it deserve? 